All right, I'm now recording. I want to welcome both of you, Wendy Schuler, the great author, and the most famous Bill, Dr. Bill Cosgrove, to Living and Aging with Pride. And I'm your host, the rambling man, James Brown. Welcome to the show and a happy Veterans Day. Thanks for having us, James. My pleasure, my pleasure. How are you doing, Wendy? Thank you. You're, you're, we're, we still got that Wi-Fi delay thing going on. I'm doing on. fine. I'm excited about our topic today. Yeah. Well, today, because this is Veterans Day, I want to start the show off with a little, you know, proclamation to veterans and that uh, we honor them today. And I got a big problem about this once a year honoring of veterans uh, when we, it's something we should be doing every day. And as we find ourselves in the thrust of this uh, pandemic, pandemonium, confusion of democracy and voting and all of that, it's even more apparent that we need to reflect and respect our veterans for what they've contributed just so we could be at this table discussing why we should vote Oh, how come you're not voting and who you're voting for and why you're voting for them. So my hat's off to the veterans and I would ask that uh, at some point in time that Congress decides to relieve veterans of any cost for housing and give them housing, waive their taxes so that they can prosper and live in life because they put their lives on the line for all of us to be able to do the things that we do. So uh, my hat's off to all the veterans and God bless you and thank you. There's a moment of silence and now we will start talking. What do you think about that, Dr. Cosgrove? Well, James, I, I think you're right. And, and <clears throat> I, I mentioned to you that I'm a veteran, but not a combat veteran. I, I, I spent three and a half years in the army as an enlisted man, as a medical corpsman in the in the 70s, while uh, Vietnam was still going on, and uh, and the the th the the thing that all of our service members do uh, is also what our first responders do, and that is they agree to take the risk of their own health and safety, their own lives if needed to help us all. And, um, and that is not uh, uh, a thing taken lightly. It's not, you know, um, the oath to uh, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution is, um, is a, a heavy burden. And the willingness to accept that risk is, uh, again, a heavy burden. And and yes, our thanks go out to both our first responders and to our uh, military servicemen. Um, even if their job description doesn't call them to be in harm's way, um, it, it, uh, they accept the risk that somebody could order, order them to be in harm's way and accept that. And that acceptance uh, is such a gift to the rest of us that we all need to be thankful. Well, that's a blessing. Well, it, 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 it's, it's, it's an embattlement, if you will, of courage and being courageous. And I think we could say the same things about our nurses that are on the front line. And I think you would know a little bit about this, uh, Wendy, that uh, to, with this pandemic uh, taking place now, we've got on the front lines, it's not the same kind of war, actually a silent bullet. This virus is a silent bullet in affecting many of us, but we find that our first responders and the people that's in the trenches, like our nurses, are, are really putting their lives on the line in, in, in the name of democracy and freedom and support. What do you say to that, Wendy? Well, I like what they're doing in the UK uh, with nurses. What they do, also ambulance drivers, first responders, is they had one day a week, I think it was Friday at a certain time, like 10 o'clock, and people would come out of their houses, remember this was during lockdown, and they would clap. 
and it was clap for first responders and they did it weekly and that way it's like a very visible thank you to first responders then many first responders would say i went to my car to go to work and there was a plate of cookies on top so i really like in the uk particularly how people directly supported them their neighbors and i think that really helped morale over there and then getting back to the veterans i love as a nurse how they can get free health care for life because sometimes some of the conditions related to being a veteran or maybe being exposed like to agent orange or something doesn't show up till later or cancer so they're not penalized for their great service they are receiving health care so i'm with you james i think that's great great well we we, we obviously we have a smorgasbord of discussions and, and today i'm calling it a free for all with wendy and bill you know because i want you guys to just throw some things out and let's talk about those things and 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 i really applaud both of you because i know that you can throw some stuff out you can talk forever so i'm gonna let you go first wendy it just tell us about your thoughts what kinds of things are you thinking about that ought to be in the discussion today tomorrow and beyond I like actually your suggestion, uh, James, you were talking about housing for midlife and aging. Right. And I was talking to a girlfriend today in Florida uh, and, and this whole topic came up with her parents. Her uh, stepdad and mother have been married for 43 years and her stepdad pulled a gun on her mother uh, a couple of weeks ago and said, I'm going to kill you. And it quickly, you know, he got evaluated and it turns out he has dementia. And the voices were telling him to do that. So part of the housing thing is what if one person's fine and you're in a situation like that where the other person suddenly is diagnosed or the dementia creeps up slowly, you have to make a housing decision. Does one stay in the house? and one goes to assisted living, or do you both move to assisted living? There's a lot of issues, and the doctor can weigh in on this too. I, and I, I think part of that too, one of the things that the, the, the Dr. Cosgrove and I have been talking about is that we've got to upgrade our consistency in going to the doctor and being checked out for a number of things, because if we start waiting these periods that you know, say five years, go get a colonoscopy and all of these things. We need to just take the liberty of doing things in advance. And dementia is something we need to understand that it happens, why it happens, and what causes it. And then you can become a monitor of it and be able to manage someone that might be in your care uh, who may have it and you may not understand that they have it. You want to add to that, uh, Dr. Cosgrove? Um, well, I was, uh, it, while you were saying that, I was sort of going down my own rabbit hole about what we owe each other as citizens of the world or citizens right. of the United States. And, and, um, and uh, you know, um, our society says that, well, you have to earn something, you have to earn housing. And, and when you look at that, you say, wait a minute, you know, all of our children need housing, deserve housing. They don't earn housing and our elderly again should uh, require housing deserve housing they've offered up uh, you know years of benefits to their to their community and yet uh, um, happenstance of an illness like dementia or you know COVID is um, going to increase the numbers of, of people who have strokes who have um, mental impairments it's going to increase that and um and it's not out of anybody's fault and in our society um keeps putting up these kind of arbitrary things of well you have to deserve it and and i think that is um uh, we as a community need to um stand up and say everybody in the community um deserves health care deserves housing deserves food deserves you know 
oxygen in the air and, and clean air to breathe and clean water to drink. And do they deserve a flat screen television or a Cadillac? No, but they deserve oh, those oh, things oh. that require them to have life. Hold that, that thought there require. for a minute, Doc. Uh, the flat screen TV and the Cadillac was very uh, impressive on my brain. I would say, give me a flat screen TV and a Cadillac and you know, I'm good to go. So, uh, so be very selective when you make those statements, you know what I mean? Okay. Well, let me see, let me clarify. Um, Thank you. You deserve it because of your good looks and your hard work and your eloquence. But uh, <laughs> that, uh, but as a, as kind of a, a basic human right, um, I, I'm not sure the flat, flat screen comes on the, the short list of basic human rights. I'm going to have to pass that on to the people who are responsible for this show uh, that <laughs> I get a Cadillac. And what else is it? A flat screen. <laughs> and a flat screen TV. That's part of my pay, you know. But uh, are we finding ourselves getting to a moment, and, and this is to both of you, where like in the 50s, suburbia was built. I'm moving to the suburbs. Are we finding that we're going to now have to start building communities that have all of the things that's needed to help people? Because we're, we're finding we're living longer and more people are living longer and becoming older. So are we going to have to start building these communities that are affordable, number one, or accessible? that have everything, the doctor, the store, all of the things that this community, these individuals need, so they don't have to drive across town to go here or there to get this or that, or we're gonna find ourselves building these little suburban communities that facilitates the aging in a variety of different ways. Is that the future? I hope so. It is in Thailand, at least. In Thailand, they have the grocers, they have everything you need, the doctor, pharmacy, in each little tiny neighborhood. So you don't even have to go a few blocks away somewhere else. You have it all right there. If we could model it like they do in Thailand, it would be perfect. And James, I'll move in if you find one. I like that. Every, you know, I don't want to have to drive everywhere. I want to have go to the coffee shop, meet my girlfriends go do this and do that right where I'm living. And that's one thing I like about the UK. Well, you don't know what you just said because I've got an ad out in a magazine saying, older baby available who wears diapers and that's me. So if you <laughs> want to change my diaper, you got a deal. <laughs> now I mean a whole community. <laughs> Not you personally, James, sorry about that. I want the whole community. Coffee that's shop too. <laughs> An added benefit um, to that is, you know, humans evolved uh, living in small groups, right. little hunter-gatherer groups and small villages. And now we are billions. And so we need, we uh, spread out. But by spreading out, we became uh, disconnected from our neighbors. Right. And, um, you know, having small communities where everything is in the community would keep people in the community rubbing elbows with other members of the community and would rebuild some of that community cohesiveness because I think it's part of our mental health. Um, we all need family and we all need extended family and, and um, gated communities and you know uh, everybody driving in and closing the garage door and never seeing right. the neighbor has kind of lessened our, our uh, commitment to each other. But isn't that what America? Yeah. Isn't that what America's foundation has been? It, it started off with these very interesting little communities of ethnicity, if you will, and and the baker, the butcher, the the grocery store, the post office. Everything was in these communities, and the the the, the, the our economic rise of America created this separation. I got money so I can go over here and live and I don't need to be there and that kind of thing. But, you know, you talked about uh, uh, Thailand having this kind of community. I think America started off building these very inclusive communities where people lived, shopped, went to the movies. All of that was within a stone's throw from your house 
in that particular community. And I think we, we, we lost that with all of this seeking of independence and separation and elitism, you know, upper class, middle class, lower class, and all of that. So we are coming back to that, I believe. I hope so, because I feel very isolated living in suburbia. I don't like it. I live part time in London. And in London, it's exactly how you say, I know my neighbors, I go to the same pharmacy, I go to the same coffee shop, I meet people, the baristas, they all know me. I could be gone six months and people are like, Wendy, how's your book doing? Right. And I don't get that in America. And it's exactly what you said, everything's right around where I need to go and I can walk everywhere. And I love that sense of community. You think of London as a big city, but it's just a bunch of little villages strung together. Absolutely. And I think that's what you're saying about America. Absolutely. We're gonna build little community. <laughs> We're gonna build little communities called living and aging with pride communities where you could go and get everything you need to have in that community and be well and taken care of. And uh, that's what this uh, this show is all about. You know, uh, you want to add to that, uh, uh, Dr. Cosgo, because I saw you shaking your head, and I know that means that you're shaking up those thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shake, shaking them loose. Um, there's a risk to uh, to having small, um, inclusive uh, communities because we have a tendency to make them exclusive. We have a tendency right. to say, well, uh, this neighborhood should only be Italian Americans and this neighborhood should only be, you know, Spanish Americans and this other neighborhood should only be uh, Afro Americans and and we'll lose some or this neighborhood should only be the elderly or right. this neighborhood should only be young families with kids and I think the healthiest communities are ones that have um, a sampling of everything right. and because um, that adds a lot of richness and surprise and um you know uh, humor is dependent on surprise but also i think wisdom is you know when you look when you read about scientific discovery right it's the element of surprise that keeps the scientists going back every day you know grinding out new data because when they get surprised they get delighted and it and it leads to something new and fresh and i think part of the one of the attributes of, of diversity is surprise and i think i think we'll lose that if we have exclusive communities but small inclusive communities has got my vote i think that'd be great well and, and i don't think that we're, we're talking about exclusivity because the workers the people who run the shops all of those people will be a, a smorgasbord of all, everything that represents our society. And I think that that's how we create a total inclusivity because those people who work at those shops have to be able mind and body in order to deliver the best service and the best product to the people who are somewhat uh, minorly handicapped in mobility, uh, both mentally and physically. So we've got to make sure that we've got enough to make it work. And we've got to make sure that there's an infusion of people. And those people who work there can also live there. And they become a part of the community. They have new babies. They, they keep working. And so the family is the total community. And that's I like communities yeah, that are connected to other ones, like London. You're in your little community, but it's easy to walk down the street and, and see other ones. Right. Um, what I don't like about suburbia, even if I had a cafe and a coffee shop across the street, is like what the doctor's saying, it could be real uh, inclusive. And I, I like to make sure that I have everything nearby, but I have access to a lot of variety of people. I agree with both of you. Whoa, I'm writing that down, you know? But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think we've got to bring some commonality to it. We, we've, as the country has grown and diversified and gotten bigger, we, we tend to want to get scientific. Everything tends to be a little more complicated than it really is. And, and I think some of that has to do with the leadership. The leadership tends to, 
make these things unattainable so that they can say they gave it to us. And that might be a little stretch. We've got to bring things down to basics so folks like you two uh, can say something and we do it and we live it and we function around. And I think that that's where the commonality of our community becomes real. Real people like you guys make the difference in the communities that we try to build. And I was quiet just yeah. to see if I got uh, okay. some, some sense of applaud or, or something. Yeah, no, I, agree with you. <laughs> I have nothing to add. I agree with you. <laughs> Gee. <laughs> <laughs> the, the director well said, is go, the director's going say something say something <laughs> oh there's no director <laughs> so let's find things over these next few podcasts let's find things that we don't necessarily is not the center of conversation but is something that ties us together but we don't talk about enough. And I know that you're on a, both of you are on a very broad advocacy program. Let's talk about those things and let's see if I can bring them back into the fold that even though it's an advocacy about this or it's about that, we are all in touch with those issues even though we think we're not. And the more we recognize all of these different advocacies and what's going on, the better we ought to put a, a, a handle on it. You want to say something there, Wendy? I do. Um, one thing we're talking about, too, is adult children come into the picture. You may find this fabulous community exactly like we're talking about, and your kids are like, that's too far away. You won't see grandkids. So sometimes it involves a decision do you do it for you which i want to do a lot of us or do you give up your life for your grandkids and kids so uh, part of aging and is being pulled in different directions you want this great community with active people midlife and older and your kids are saying no no don't give up the family home so it can be a difficult decision james well, and I agree with that. The, the other day, uh, the, the doctor and I were cruising over the, uh, the the city and the valley and the plain, and I looked out of the window and I saw these patches of large pieces of land that really I didn't even know was connected back to the city. One of the things that we're developing is the transportation, the transit service when we start planning and that's where planning and zoning and policies all come into play if we start doing this right we can make everything you know i mean let's take the heart the heart has arteries and veins that cover our body you know if any one of those veins or arteries are shut down the body has a problem well why can't we build communities that or connected to the heart of the community, but they may be 10 miles away, but we've got transportation that takes people there back and forth. We build to facilitate our total community and not just one or two places. And I think that that's the problem that's happening today is that we've got the suburbia is way over there or way down there and they go, I'm going to the city like it's a big trip. You know, it's 35 miles from Provo to Salt Lake City, and I've gone to Provo, and people, and for all of you people, Provo is a little suburb, uh, sub area in the Utah Salt Lake Valley. I've gone to Provo, and people have not gone 35 miles to come up to Salt Lake City, the capital. You know, so we get so regimented to our environment <clears throat> that we don't pay attention. Well, the policies need to pay attention to the whole body and not just the one area. That's my big thing is public transport. I love it. Um, where I live, it is dismal. I, you can't get between cities. Um, it, it's horrible. Right. 
in the western part of the uh, America, eastern part, it's much easier to get around. And also in the UK, you can go to the tiniest little village in Upper Scotland, Northern Scotland, and you, you, there's transport there. And I think what you're saying is so true, James. Um, you got to get this done in Washington or something. Well, Do it for, yeah, you're amazing. Well, bless your heart. Thank you. But we're going to put this show out there, and, and your point of view, the doctor's point of view, is so important because we don't hear these voices, and we're just like everybody else. And they need to know the people who support their issue. You know, we put a label on transportation, on public transportation. The word public transportation also said, oh, anybody can ride that. We've got to take that segregated mentality out of public set transportation and, and go, this is a method of getting you to where you need to get to. And don't put it's cheap or it's free or any of those things need not be attached to the fact that it's a mode, save and clear the air, make sure we can move the, the largest body of people in a very economical way, which saves money, which helps our economic growth. We've got to talk about it from that perspective rather than I don't ride public transportation. Ooh, anybody can ride a bus, you know, and, and that's why public transportation gets a second seat in this whole idea that it is probably the safest, cleanest mode of moving massive amounts of people from one point to the other. And if we would accept that in that logical way, rather than it's a low income mode of transportation, we might find more people would, and sports I think has probably done the biggest thing for public transportation, because you get to the arena in droves on the bus or on the train or, or all of those kinds of things. So we've got to really change the dynamics and the words we use in describing the things that facilitate making people's lives easier and better. Doctor? And James, um, classically, we've had industrial uh, productivity and workplaces clustered in the, the center of a city and right. housing units separated out. And, um, and it clearly, that worked in the 1950s and 60s, but clearly we need a different uh, model. And so we really, need, as we're sort of putting together communities, they also need to have, um, we need to disperse the jobs so that the jobs are also out in those communities. Exactly. And, and, um, and there's a classism that, uh, that does affect public transportation, which is tragic. Um, and you know the car our 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 the United States has been in love with the car from for the last whatever seventy years and um and it's our downfall. It has separated us, it has made us misuse our environment, it has polluted our environment, it has wasted a lot of of wealth that a family could have instead they get you know they spend a lot of that maintaining a car um and and it, it's become an elitist thing of how fancy your car is, is somehow a measure of your own personal value, which is so distorted, it's ugly. Um, and I think we need to, uh, as a community, as a, as a state, as a country, say, hey, you know, this uh, transportation has given us the illusion of freedom. Right. It's not really freedom because you still have to follow the, the rules and you know, in order to drive down the street, you have to be aware and follow 50 rules. So it's not exactly freedom. And um, it's given us the illusion of freedom at the cost of, of separating us from our families, separating us from our community and, um, and polluting our air. So I think, uh, um, I think at some point we have to say, hey, let's charge for gasoline for fuel for our automobiles, what it really costs, what it costs to in devastation of our environment and all of that, Absolutely. so that we sort of gradually price ourselves away from the car and 
price ourselves back to uh, communal transportation. Well, and, and, and I think some of that problem is, as we discovered America, we discovered these new wealths and ability to have wealth and, and do it. But we didn't determine what that meant to have that wealth. We didn't determine what it takes to have gasoline or oil or any of those things. We only thought about its substance as it affected what we need to use it for. Well, today, we think about things that we discover or we use and what its end result is. And that's why America, that's why the world can be a stronger and better place because we now not only look at the beginning of something, but we have understanding of what the ending means. And that's going to give us a better level of guidance as to what we develop once we put all of those pieces in place. And, and I think what's happening in America today because of the coronavirus is that we're starting to think about the beginning and the ending. You know, it's what caused this, this COVID-19 or 18 or whatever it is, and what is it affecting and how are we handling it and what's the end result and how do we not get back in the same situation again? And those things become the charts that we use as we discover new industries. Solar energy, we're now looking at it not only as a source to turn the lights on, but to power our equipment, you know, to fuel growing our, our uh, crops and all of these things. So there's many faceted connections to it and we're controlling it so that we don't use it like we've used oil. And fortunately, we aren't faced with the calamity of uh, atomic bombs, nuclear wars, and all of that, because everybody, no matter what they say, know if they drop a bomb, it's history for everybody. It's not just Germany or Taiwan or wherever the heck it is. It's everybody's affected. So they're finding different ways to fight wars and it's economical and it's a whole bunch of other stuff. And I won't get into that this series, but we'll talk about it later. But so we're learning things that we can apply to our technology and to our new industry, you know, you know, hacking and all of this stuff that's going on with the internet. We're learning about it. We're starting to manage it. And, and that's what's going to happen. So there's a lot for us to do, a lot for us to learn. And uh, I'm grateful to, to have the privilege to, of calling you guys my friends and my associates. And we're going to keep percolating information and responding to it uh, uh, as we go forward with this show. And, and it's going to be the best darn show in America and across the globe because that's what Wendy said. I got nothing. <laughs> I got absolutely, absolutely nothing. <laughs> Not a good day for me. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, James. Well said, I'm, James. <laughs> James, I'm going to uh, tie us back to how we started this conversation in Veterans Please. Day. Um, we, we are at war. Um, we're at war with this virus tiny right. tiny little bit of misinformation is what a virus is right. and we are the whole world is at war right. and uh, back in February I was hopeful that um, because every country was going to be hit by this and every person on the planet was going to be vulnerable to this that it would pull us together that we would see that we are all in this together we're fighting a common enemy right. um, and that hasn't happened. But let me compare it to other wars that we've had. Currently, in the last nine months, COVID has killed more Americans than were killed in all of the battlefields of World War II. All of the combat deaths, we've killed more from the COVID virus than we did in World War II. Something like tw double the number that we lost in World War I. Right. Uh, the more than double the number that we lost in Korea, Vietnam, plus Afghanistan, plus uh, Iraq twice. And um, so we have to see this as a war. And, um, and so that when you think about the veterans, we have now the warfare is on our own shores, in our own neighborhoods, 
and we have an awful lot of families who are now veterans, families who've had to face down death, families who have had to uh, recover from the loss of one of their family members, one of their servicemen, and um, and we need to um, start working on a way to grieve and heal after COVID, like we had to grieve and heal after World War II, and and I. Uh, I think we need to treat it as seriously as a world war. I like that. You want to have a closing closing statement, Wendy? I agree uh, with the doctor. And part of it, when there's uh, fighting and guns and bombs, people tend to take it more seriously. And I think part of the problem is a lot of Americans felt it, uh, COVID-19 that I talked to was more of a political thing versus a health thing, which I got angry at being a nurse. So I think if we treat it like a war and look at it that way, that it does cause injuries and death, then maybe people will take it more seriously. Well, I think they had better. Hey, I thank you both for joining and I will send another invitation out to you. Uh, and I'm gonna try to invite somebody else on so we can have somebody else pitter pattering in our ear. But uh, I am blessed to have you guys on board. I think today's conversation is helpful. And the more we talk about things, the more we get people to do things. So thank you both for being a guest on Living and Aging with Pride and keep smiling, be happy, and keep doing what you're doing because it's working. God bless Thank you. Thank you, James. All right, you guys have a great day and I, I love you dearly. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.